All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to our second quarter macro presentation. Um, disclaimer I give every time. I know the microphone's not working. It's There's people on Zoom, so it's for them, not y'all. So if you can't hear us, just tell us to be louder. Um, the goal is to make Ben hoarse by the end of these 78 slides. He shortened it down this time, so we got it under 80 slides. We'll be powering through them. Uh, but appreciate everybody, as always, for being here. Uh, thanks to the Investment Committee for putting all this together. Um, if you have questions, my recommendation, Ben, if you're good with this, is just to hold them towards the end. We can go back to any slide uh, that you have, but we'll just kind of hit Q&A at the end. Um, and if you have anything real individualized as it relates to your portfolio, just come talk to us. Um, we don't want anyone here to know how much money you all have, uh, especially not with my parents here. Um, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ben and he'll start driving. Yeah, we got a quick disclaimer here, uh, but you guys can read that very quickly. Um, double dip recession is a term that's used oftentimes about a year to two years after the last recession. And that's kind of what people are talking about today. Um, it tends to coincide with what people are doing in terms of the Federal Reserve and tightening monetary policy. You go from monetary easing to monetary tightening. And Tom will talk a lot about that today. Um, and right now, what we're seeing is that there's a very narrow path in terms of the off ramp to a more normalized environment. And that's, that's really the focus of what we're going to be talking about today. What does that off ramp look like? And how can we get through that narrow gate? So we're going to start off by just talking and setting the stage with the state of play, where we are with the war, where we are with inflation, where we are with sentiment. But then we really want to spend the meat of the presentation talking about what everyone's talking about. What's, what are freight rates doing? What's inflation doing? What's with this yield curve inversion? Does that mean that we're going into a recession in six to 12 months, which a lot of people will talk about, especially on CNBC or Bloomberg? And then finally, we'll just wrap it up with how to think about managing your portfolio uh, in the context of an uncertain environment. So I'm going to start off by just acknowledging the obvious, gas prices are up a lot. Um, and this is causing a lot of consternation. It's causing a lot of people to talk about uh, inflation and gas prices and, and what's going to happen with their budget. And that's blamed a lot on the war. And it, over the next few slides, we'll talk about the war, the economy, and the sentiment. But we're going to start by talking about the war in Russia and Ukraine. Right now, the status is that Ukraine is actually holding stronger than I thought it would have. I did not think Kyiv would hold it as it did. Um, I thought the Russians would have been better ready to, to go in and accomplish what they want to accomplish. Uh, so the good news is that Ukraine's actually holding up rather strong, but Russia's not really backing down from a lot of its goals. Right now, they, their goals are to establish a land bridge between Crimea and the Donbass region. That's the Donetsk and Luhansk. They want Ukraine neutrality. They don't want NATO. And Ukraine, for its part, it's saying we don't want to cede any territory. And that includes Crimea. And it's extremely understandable. I mean, no country wants to cede any territory. Uh, they also want a third party security guarantee. So that's where we stand right now. Obviously, it's all subject to change. But the the thing that's surprising me is how well Ukraine has held thus far. What has also surprised me is the limit imp limited impact economically of the sanctions that we've imposed. Um, we meaning the United States and the rest of the Western world. If you look at the currency, this is the Russian ruble. So this is how many rubles it takes to buy one US dollar. And right now it's sitting at about 83 rubles to the dollar. When that chart goes up, it means that the ruble is weakening. When that chart goes down, it means the ruble is strengthening. What's remarkable to me is that you've basically seen no change in the Russian currency from the time that Russia invaded Ukraine and we put in all those sanctions to where we are today. In fact, a couple of days ago, this was 75. The ruble had actually strengthened versus the US dollar. Similarly, if you look at the uh, impact to the Russian stock market, uh, you know, you had the dip before as people were a little bit nervous and, and rushing for the exits uh, because they were concerned about the invasion. But at the time they invaded to today, 
the Russian stock market is up between 25 and 30 percent, depending on what day. And if you look at the economy, on the surface, the Russian economy actually looks like it's doing better than it was before. Energy exports are expected to be up about 50% over last year. Uh, the current account surplus, which is your exports minus your imports, that's expected to about double. The first number, the $205 billion number there is Goldman's uh, estimate of Russia's current account surplus for this year. The $240 billion number is uh, the Institute for International Finance. So whichever way you look at it, the current account surplus for Russia is actually doing fairly well. And a lot of that's due to um, the fact that we've limited a lot of imports going into Russia, but we haven't limited nearly as many exports that are coming out of Russia. Russia is finding other ways to sell us oil and the Europeans can't do without natural gas from Europe. Within Russia, it's a little bit of a different story. You get these monthly barometers of how the Russian economy is doing from a sentiment level. And you see on the manufacturing side, a lot of companies actually are negative on, on what's going on in, in Russia. A lot of services companies are fairly negative on what's going on in Russia. But in terms of the broad economic data and the, the money that's flowing into Russia, Russia could be argued that they're actually benefiting from these sanctions. The impact of these sanctions um, will be felt longer term. I had a conversation, well, I was a member of about 15 people uh, down at Georgia Tech and Dennis Lockhart, the prior Federal uh, Reserve President for Atlanta, he was there and he was talking and it was a fairly intimate conversation. And he was talking about um, the thinking on sanctions is that they don't work until the sanctions were applied on Iran. And he said, at that point, they seem to work. They seem to bring about some of that change. But the point being, you have to put these sanctions in place for a long period of time uh, and keep them in place. And so his hypothesis was that if we continue to do this with Russia, they'll become almost like a North Korea pariah state with whom no one trades. Uh, the X factor, obviously, is the oil and natural gas. And, you know, if they recently, uh, Russia recently offered India a $35 discount on barrels of oil and India was only too happy to, to take that discount. So uh, without controlling the entire consumptive base of the world, it's difficult to really have those sanctions play an immediate term impact. In terms of Europe, encouragingly, we've had a lot of headlines, we've had a lot of market volatility, but the economic data has actually not deteriorated substantially yet. So these sanctions are hitting Russia more than Europe and more than the United States, but they're not, um, but they're not really hitting Russia all that much. Obviously, the inflation pic picture is a function of this, but I would say, I mean, especially if you look at that data on the prior chart, to say that this is Putin's price hike, I think, is not the whole whole picture by any means. Um, inflation was clearly accelerating before this. A lot of this was driven by used car prices. That that's starting to fall. And I do think, I mean, if we extrapolate these used car prices, which are beginning to decline going forward, I would expect that inflation rate to start to fall down just a little bit. Um, but it'll still remain elevated uh, because there, you just have a inflation momentum throughout this economy. And that's playing a role in Fed monetary policy. Uh, and that's called quantitative tightening. So as everybody remembers, when COVID struck and the market started to fall, we basically saw a break in both the stock market and the bond market, uh, which was essentially uh, there was no liquidity. And so how do you fight that if you're the Fed? The Fed steps in and they basically drop rates to zero. Borrowing becomes essentially free. And that really frees up the economy. It basically says, hey, if you need money, we're the lender of last resort. Uh, and so that was super effective. Uh, for the economy, it fixed the bond market really overnight. I mean, we were seeing bonds hit the market that hadn't been, you know, at available at those prices for years and years and years, and it just cratered. And the Fed came in and they said, hey, we're the lender of last resort. We're dropping rates to zero. We're pumping the, the market full of money. We're buying bonds all across the yield curve in order to bring rates down. Uh, and that really helped to stabilize the economy. However, now we're in a position where we're seeing the effects of that. And a lot of the inflation that we're seeing is based on the fact that there's just money just sloshing around the economy. And so in order to combat that, the Fed has to tighten. Uh, and what that entails is raising the federal fund rates 
funds rate and then uh, rolling off the balance sheet. So all those bonds that they bought, they've now got to find a way to either unload them, let them mature. And so what we have now is uh, a series of rate hikes that could continue for quite some time. And so you can see on the left-hand side, we have the implied number of rates we were going to see in December was four and March was eight. And now, you know, as of today, we're looking at about nine and a half. It ticked down just a little bit after the soft CPI print this morning, but uh, they did raise 0.25% in March. Uh, they were intending to raise 0.5% uh, if there had not been the war in Ukraine. Uh, but basically from here on out, we're going to see the Fed tighten uh, and raise rates and basically try to slow inflation by slowing the economy. And they, they have a dual mandate. And that mandate is maximum employment uh, and keeping inflation in check. And right now, they're very comfortable with the jobs market. We've been covering a lot of these jobs reports uh, on the morning calls. And basically, the jobs market is as tight as it's ever been. I mean, it's just, um, there's 11 million open jobs. There's about 5 million people who are unemployed. Uh, and unemployment is at a very, very low rate. And they're basically saying, we're going to do a sacrifice in the jobs market and a sacrifice on growth in order to bring in inflation. Because if you don't bring in inflation, you're not going to have a good jobs market and you're not going to have growth. And so that's basically the stance they're taking. Um, and so right now we're looking at about 9.6 rate hikes for the year. Uh, which would bring the federal funds rate up to about two and a half or so, which is about the neutral rate. Uh, and that's what we're going to see over the next couple of months. And that's going to be uh, pretty impactful on the economy, though this next slide will show you that it's not all bad news. And if you watch financial media, they're going to say, hey, raising rates is going to crush the economy. Uh, you know, no one's going to be able to borrow money. All these companies, you know, their valuations are going to be reset based on uh, the depreciation of higher rates. But if you look, historically speaking, there are very few periods of time where raising rates significantly has impacted the, the stock market, uh, at least in the following 12 months. So it's not something that we really need to be fearful of because a normalized rate environment is actually very, very positive for the economy. But there's going to be volatility. There's going to be growing pains because as they pull that money out, there's going to be less liquidity. And the less liquid something is, the more the price moves. And so that's something to be uh, cognizant of as we enter this tightening period. And of course, that's going to affect mortgage rates. You know, as they start to roll off the balance sheet at present, they're looking to roll off $95 billion a month. $65 billion of that is going to be treasuries. But the other $35 billion is going to be these mortgage-backed securities they've been buying, which have kept mortgage rates uh, you know, artificially low for some time. And if you listen to our morning calls, we were absolutely pounding the table in the summer of 2020 saying, hey, if you're going to be in your house for the next five years, refinance right now, because uh, it's probably never going to get better than it is right now. And we've seen that turn around exceptionally quickly to start the year. Um, but, you know, if you think of the economy as a whole, the American dream is right to own a home. And if you make it more and more expensive to own a home in terms of the amount of interest that you're paying, that's going to slow the economy at whole, right? Because there are less houses changing hands. That's less money for banks. That's less money for Home Depot as people move into their houses. It's less money for rooms to go as you try and furnish your house. So if you think of how can we best slow the economy so we don't just burn this thing up, you know, the mortgage rate is something to be very cognizant of. And so this next slide, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew. This is basically us going through and looking at, you know, the four of us, we bought houses all in the last two years, what the difference in the price of owning our homes would be, you know, if we had to buy our same house right now. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So the exercise we went through is we essentially looked at our purchase price of our homes, as well as the interest rates that we have on our mortgages right now. We compared them to current estimates whether it was from realtor.com or Zillow or kind of a hybrid of both and what interest rates are right now. And you can see uh, the price impact is pretty staggering. And if you look at that next to last column, it talks about the total payment. That is how much the monthly mortgage payment would increase if we were to buy the exact same homes we're living in right now today. Um, you can see one of us was a real ringleader of this exercise, bought a new home in April of 2019. Uh, and looking at almost doubling that mortgage, July of 19, almost doubling, uh, going on further, still looking at 50% increases. So the cost of owning a home, even owning the same home you probably own right now is going up pretty significantly. And that's creating some challenges. This is not a new problem. This is not something that's unique. It has nothing to do with Russia and Ukraine. It has something to do with COVID and some of the trends that happened there. But if we, as we said, time and time again, not only in these quarterly presentations, but also on those morning calls uh, that we do every morning at 830, COVID did one big thing economically, and that was it accelerated a lot of trends that were already in place. And so 
home prices are continuing to rise. You can see commentary from Lennar uh, that they gave just a couple weeks ago. Gross margin and net margin remain strong. The upward spiral of housing purchase is accelerating. And so we're continuing to see challenges there. Uh, and if you look at that uh, chart there, it's a little bit hard to see, but the median sales price, according to Redfin, that top line is what you should be looking at for 2022. And so you can really see the gap of what's going on there on a year over year basis. Uh, low supply is gonna yield higher prices. We were underbuilt for a decade plus coming out of the great financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And because of that, there is an undersupply in the market. This was not caused by COVID. It was going to have an impact on home prices at some point. COVID really accelerated it. When millennials had to work from home from their parents' basements, they decided, hey, maybe it's time to buy my own place. A lot of people moved out of cities, started buying single family homes, leaving apartments. Those were trends that really accelerated, but they were already starting to happen in 2019 uh, in that way. And so if you look at the average age of inventory, meaning how long has a home been on the market, you can see here that bottom line is what we're looking at in 2022. So homes are staying on the market for a very, very brief period of time. It's probably making a couple people in here, whether you're a mortgage originator or an inspector, it's probably making your life a little bit hectic as you try to cram these things through and get to closings quickly because you have to. But we're seeing very, very little time on the market for homes. Mortgage and rent expense continues to be something to watch. Uh, as you look here, you can see uh, Georgia, Atlanta, and the U.S. Georgia is a hot spot to be. Apartment rent growth is clearly elevating. It's continuing on that trend. Uh, growth is very similar to what we're seeing on actual home price appreci appreciation. Uh, and you're going to see those things kind of feed off each other for a while. If people are slow to buy a home because their mortgage is going to be very, very high, they may not find a whole lot of relief in the form of rental because they're going to be paying pretty sizable rent payments on an ongoing basis. Not surprisingly, this is impacting consumer confidence. What's interesting here is the blue line is where consumers currently are. So they feel pretty good about their current situation. But if you notice just recently the divergence between the blue line going up a little bit and the orange line going down, people are getting paid more, but they also realize their home payments going up, their apartments going up, home prices are going up, and gas prices are going up. And that concern about the future uh, is certainly impacting the consumer right now. It's also impacting CEOs. This looks significant because it, I mean, it goes back a year. But if you went back two years, this, that would include COVID. The 6.1 reading that we got in April was lower than any time during COVID. In fact, it was the lowest level since October 2016 uh, when the election turmoil was going on uh, before the 2016 elections. CEOs are concerned about what the future holds for them. And the reason they're concerned is primarily inflation. Uh, in fact, it goes inflation number one, interest rate increases, uh, excuse me, supply chain disruptions too. The Ukraine invasion is fourth on the list. Inflation is definitely the hot button issue right now. And that's the reason, as Tom mentioned, the Fed is trying its best to try to get that inflation down. You can make the argument, and I think that Tom would, that the Fed should have acted six to nine months ago. Um, and I'd certainly have sympathy for that argument. Uh, Powell was trying to get renominated as the chairman of the Federal Reserve. But right now, the thing that's causing CEOs the biggest distress is inflation over some of those other issues. And what's interesting is this goes across industry. Um, you know, we have all the industries broken out. The only one that actually increased from March to April was professional services, I think consulting, things, things like that. And the reason that increased was because they think there's a higher likelihood of regime change in the uh, midterm elections, which I don't think is a good reason to be optimistic. It would be great if the reason to be optimistic was things are improving right now. So that's why uh, CEO confidence has, has declined. In our own little survey that we do just across uh, local Atlanta businesses, we found that People are continuing to invest in wages. People are continuing to invest in capital spending. A lot of the same themes that we had three months ago when we did this survey. People continue to think that their own company is going to do better than the Atlanta economy. Um, but what's really notable about this survey is 
what's not on the chart there. And that is some of the commentary we had was basically to the effect of we're keeping our heads down and we're just trying to operate our business. Um, things out, out there are going to do what they're going to do. And we're just trying to spend all of our time right now to manage what we can control in front of us, which again means that maybe you're thinking a little bit less creatively. Maybe you're thinking a little bit less innovatively, which would feed into some of those readings that we got on the CEO side. Going back to that CEO survey, the decline in confidence is impacting plans to make hiring uh, over the next 12 months, plans to invest in capital expenditures. This is something we're going to continue to focus significantly on because capital expenditures are a beautiful thing because they pay, they are an injection into the economy today when the capital is purchased. And it's also an injection in the future when you use that capital to yield better productivity improvements and uh, you need employees to manage that capital. So the summary of where we are right now is that the war continues to be extremely volatile, and I don't want to dismiss the fact that there are tail risks associated with that. Um, right now, though, the actual impact to the economy and the market is relatively insignificant. I mean, if the Russian stock market is up and the currency is flat, I don't think we can really blame a lot of the current market volatility on simply what's going on with the war, or frankly, the decline in CEO confidence. Inflation is really that, not, that, that issue. Um, it's causing issues in home prices, it's causing issues in confidence, and that's where we have uh, the biggest reservations going forward. So we wanna spend the next few minutes to actually talk about what everyone else is talking about. Tom's gonna to be talking about the yield spread and what Jay Powell thinks about that in terms of the yield curve inversion that we saw lately, but we're actually gonna get started with energy prices and how that's playing a role in the economy. First of all, on oil, oil's actually remained in a channel. There's been some volatility as a result of the war, but again, as we, we talked about, you're not seeing the massive economic or market impact from the war that a lot of people might want to attribute. Um, you did see that spike, but markets are gonna spike in, on an interim basis, but the long-term impact of that is relatively small and if you look at even what gas prices, uh, the role gas prices play for people who make less than $50,000 a year, it's gone from about 7% of a, of a consumer budget to 9% of a consumer budget. And that's for people who make less than $50,000 a year. So there are a lot of other aspects of inflation that are more significant than gas. The thing is, we just see it whenever we drive down the highway. Um, and that's even less of an impact for people who make $125,000 a year. That's the chart on the right. What we are a little bit concerned about is the rising natural gas prices. Natural gas prices are up about 50% from the end of the year. And this is used in a lot of applications, uh, chemicals, fertilizers, um, obviously utilities uh, use natural gas a lot for energy. In fact, uh, natural gas powers 38% of the electricity in the United States. Coal does another 22%. The point here is renewables are not going to be able to offset some of these increases that we're seeing in natural gas prices. So the question is why are natural gas prices increasing so much? I would posit that the, we're talking a lot about supply, uh, but demand is also an issue. Uh, demand is a significant issue, especially if we include the export demand uh, that's increased from Japan and Europe. Um, but one of the things that people like to talk about is the rig count. We have 673 operating rigs right now in the U.S. That's down from almost 2,000 in 2014 during the boom. And it's still about half of what it was uh, a few years ago. You have many fewer employees in the oil and gas sector. So the thinking is, man, we're just producing a lot less natural gas. Thing is, we're doing a lot more with less because this is the actual natural gas production in the United States going back 10 years. What we found is that oil and gas companies are doing a much better job and have been much more effective at actually extracting natural gas. Um, we're producing pretty much record levels of natural gas, but we're doing it with fewer wells, we're doing it with fewer employees, and we're doing it with fewer rigs. So this is a good sign. We'd love to see productivity continue at this rate and actually um, get 
uh, produce more gas because renewables might not be able to provide that impetus in the near term. As far as the consequences of higher energy prices, I think the biggest thing is going to be, uh, we'll probably see some more investment in renewables, um, which you might think, well, why are we investing in renewables when we should be investing in natural gas? But the thing is, it's a portfolio approach and uh, you kind of just got to go where the priorities of, of the, the public are. And right now that seems to be renewable. So uh, I think that you'll continue to see more investment in that side of the equation. So that's on energy prices. On, in terms of freight rates, this has garnered a lot of market angst over the last really just a few weeks. What happened last year is that we added 86,000 new owner operators uh, onto the market in terms of dry van capacity. Dry van, there's, there's really three types of trucking three main types of trucking. You got the dry van, which are the, the big trucks that um, are dry. They're, they're covered. And uh, then you have the flatbeds where you can stack lumber. You have things that um, need to be tied down properly. And then you have reefer, uh, which handles a lot of produce. Um, dry van rates are uh, often used as a proxy for economic demand because it's a classic supply and demand situation with uh, de where the demand function is for goods in the economy. And when you see that rate falling down, people get concerned that the demand for goods is falling as well. And we're seeing this even, even better chart here. You can see that we're a bit down about 10% now. This is a little bit stale data, um, but we're down about 10% in terms of national average for dry van rates, which is definitely squeezing the margins of a lot of these new trucking companies. If you look at the market demand index, it's definitely fallen, uh, but it's fallen to levels that are still elevated relative to pre-pandemic levels. What we wanna be cognizant of is if this trend continues and actually falls down to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we have a lot more capacity. It makes sense that rates will come back from the very elevated levels that they were at last year. Um, but we still don't want the demand indicator to fall down all the way to pre-pandemic levels. There's a analyst out there called Freight Waves. Um, it's FreightWaves.com. It was started in 2017. And he looks at um, the tender rejection index. And this is basically the percentage of outbound tenders. So a shipper tenders, uh, tenders out um, to trucking companies uh, potential routes and shipments to be delivered. And what the trucking companies then come back and, and say, well, we want this or we don't want this. And what we're seeing is the rejection rate from those trucking companies is falling. And when that falls, it means that they're just taking the work that they can get, which is again, a sign that the demand uh, in the industry is, uh, that the supply and demand balance in the industry is loosening significantly. And it's having an impact on trucking stocks. This is the S&P 500 trucking index. It's down about 18% uh, in just a week. Um, and so a lot of analysts have really reacted aggressively to this. Uh, it's still up from last July. It's up about 4% from July. But you can see, you know, going into uh, the holiday season last year, people were really excited about all the goods they were going to ship. And uh, a lot of truckers came to the market. And now we're kind of paying for that. So trucking stocks have definitely been hit significantly over the last week. So the question is, why are we seeing this? Um, we're definitely seeing easing congestion in the network. There are fewer people out for COVID. Uh, the network has more fluidity. You're not waiting as long at a warehouse to get unloaded. This will free up some capacity. You also have a bunch of new trucking companies who have entered the industry. Um, You've also have uh, improved retail inventories. People are saying, you know, we, we can ship it by train. It's a lot cheaper. It's more environmentally friendly. So we're going to trip ship it by locomotive rather than shipping it by truck. And then the fourth potential reason is you do have a, might have a slowing economy. You might have marginally less demand, and that's why we're watching that trucking demand index very closely. And you want to talk about consumer spending? 
Yeah, so last week I was out of town. Uh, we had a very uh, fancy spring break trip with the kids to uh, Dollywood and Pigeon Forge. Um, nothing but the best for the family. But on, I think it was Wednesday last week, Ben sending all these really bearish, pessimistic economic data points on our investment committee chat. I had to send Tom into his office for a wellness check, make sure everything was okay. Because I was looking around and it was like, everybody that looks like they have no money is spending a lot of money. It was hot rod week in Pigeon Forge. There was people buying used Buicks. The live alligator gift shop, like you could not find a parking spot if you had to. So I was like, what's going on? And it, and it, and it really supports what we're talking about here. We are seeing a big transition uh, from the good side of the economy uh, into the service side of the economy. And so if you look at this, people are spending a lot more money on travel. The first chart you're going to see there is airline spending based on income. Uh, you can see those making under 50000 are actually spending even more on a relative basis in terms of the growth of what they're spending on travel than those making over 125000 But you're seeing a very common trend, even over just a couple short months, that as COVID has moved to the backdrop of the national conversation and even the international conversation, people are starting to travel. If you look at that second chart, uh, there's not a whole lot of green there, but look at February on the airlines, a massive increase uh, in spending on airlines. So we're starting to see more and more money being spent on traditional services, things like vacations, et cetera. Uh, this will show you a little bit in terms of where people are spending money kind of on a more itemized list. Uh, and we're seeing more spending at the grocery store, a little bit less on Uber Eats, things like that. You can see takeout and food delivery, it's fourth from the bottom, uh, taking a little bit of a hit compared to what's happening at the grocery store. And some of that's going to be driven uh, by inflation, as you would imagine. But we're seeing uh, pretty interesting trends in terms of people. The most interesting one to me is probably the home furnishings and decor. Uh, we have a number of clients that do renovations, fix up houses, things like that. Uh, they had backlogs like you wouldn't believe through 2020. Uh, you know, Talking with one of them, he said in April of 2020, he was wondering if he was going to be out of business and he had a record year. Uh, 21, same thing. I talked with him in February or March of last year. He was like, I'm going to blow last year out of the water. Um, but we're starting to see some of those things start to decline as people transition where they're spending. Uh, here you can show, uh, see data on retailers and how demand is holding up. Uh, Nike said the demand continued to exceed supply. We watched Nike very specifically when they released earnings uh, in March because we we're trying to get a read through on what demand looked like. And it was a very telling fact that they said, demand is stronger than supply. Uh, if you look at Home Depot, homeowners balance sheets have never been healthier. Uh, we've been talking about the strength of the American consumer really for several years. I mean, one of the most underrated facts of the COVID year of 2020 was that it, when we got to the end of the year, American households on the median had made more money than they had the prior year and they had saved more money than they had the prior year. So there is money sitting there ready to be spent. We've been seeing that spent more on goods. We're starting to see that transition more to the service side. And yet, despite that, retailers have sold off pretty significantly. You've got companies like Nike saying there's more demand than we can supply. And yet retail stocks have really taken a hit down 15% from where they peaked out in November. So where is this angst coming from? A lot of it is driven by higher gas prices and inflation. You know, if you're spending more money on essentials, you're probably going to have less in your pocketbook for discretionary spending, unless your pay increase year over year was so significant that it didn't matter. But you're seeing a real impact there. In fact, one of the things we've talked about on the morning call before is the fact that we actually think higher gas prices could be pretty useful in reducing overall inflation. Because if people are in fact spending significantly more at the pump, they may have less discretionary money to be spending. We're seeing a huge shift to services, that, which we talked about at the beginning of my section here. Uh, and we're also seeing that a year ago, people were getting kind of their last of their stimulus payments and their checks, whether it was in the form of a tax refund or just a check that showed up in the mail or something that was direct deposited. So a lot of these retailers are going to be dealing with very difficult comps, meaning how do we compare to a year ago? Uh, some of it's as simple as we have a later Easter. You see more spending around holidays, lower spending on spring and summer merchandise, 
that's going to be an impact of the calendar alone. And we are potentially seeing that slowing economy. Is there less demand? Nike would argue, maybe, maybe not, but there's still more demand than we can supply. Uh, but it'll be very interesting. I think one of the biggest things we'll be watching this earnings season, which is really kicking off right now in earnest, is what is demand looking like for these retail stocks? I will pass it back to Ben. Yeah, I think the, the market is great at shooting first and asking questions later. And maybe they're right. Maybe it's, maybe it's right. Maybe it's not. And so just highlight one or two here. And that is big ticket spending expectations are holding up. We showed this chart in December in, in, at the January presentation using the December data. And, and it looked like people were pretty optimistic about investing in a new home or buying a new car. And that's still the case. Uh, people are still interested in buying a new vehicle, uh, a little bit less so than February, because they don't want to be stupid and buy it at a, at a very high elevated price. Um, but they're really still interested in buying a new home. And that, that's shown in the extremely low home inventory data. So big ticket spending expectations are actually still up. People are moving some marginal money to services, but they're also looking at investing in the future. And at the same time, just like we saw in retailers, home building stocks, auto stocks, they're down 30 to 35% this year. Um, again, the sense is that Although demand still exceeds supply, whatever that demand was, if demand was 1.3 supply before, maybe it's only 1.1 times supply now. That's the thinking, and that's what the market is basing its, uh, its understanding of. I think that's a little bit of shooting first, asking questions later, um, but we're definitely seeing that pattern play out in the market. We're seeing it play out in banks as well. Um, now, banks are also going down for a different reason. A lot of people would say that higher interest rates should be good for banks. The thing for banks, though, is how those interest rates relate. Banks tend to lend long, which means they, they lend over a multiple years and they borrow short. Um, so you want a big spread between those two. Uh, and that's not where we're getting, are we, Tom? Yeah, so most people, when I started talking about the yield curve, start to glaze over. It's something you might have seen in a finance class 25 years ago, but it's probably affects your daily life more than almost any measure in the uh, economy. And so what we're looking at here is the, is the change in rates, and the bottom line is the two-year treasury, and the top line is the 10-year treasury. And what you can see here is we've seen a significant sell-off in two-year treasury compared to the 10-year treasury, which is a flattening of the yield curve. So if you think of the yield curve, it basically equates to, I'm gonna give you money. The longer I give you money, theoretically, the more I should get paid. What we're seeing with a flat yield curve is the opposite, or even an inverted yield curve, which we had very briefly for uh, three, four days last week, is that I could lend you money for two years and get paid more than if I lent you money for 10 years. And that, traditionally speaking, uh, is something that the financial news media will say is a harbinger of a recession. And so, what we've seen is short bonds, which are most uh, directly affected by the federal funds rate, as they raise rates on the front end or tell you that they are going to, people are thinking, well, I've got these short bonds and the Fed can affect the short end of the curve. These are going to lose value very quickly. And so we've seen a huge move on the two-year treasury and people who are buying you know, 10-year treasuries have not seen that much of a move. And that is a, a sign that people are more willing to say, hey, I'm going to put my money in this thing for 10 years. I'm going to get paid pennies on the dollar. And the market probably isn't going to do much. And it's a very pessimistic shape of the yield curve. You know, and if you were in one of these macro presentations, call it, you know, two years ago, back in 2019, when we did them at the office, we were in a very similar situation uh, where the Fed was raising rates, the front end of the curve came up and the back end did not. And we inverted and everyone can say, oh, well, you know, 14 months later, we had COVID, we had a recession. You know, was that causation? Probably not. But just like we are now, it was a situation where it was the first time that the Fed had raised rates and uh, artificially caused an inversion in the yield curve. And we're back there again. And we've done a lot of, data of, of analysis and Sam's gonna get into the, the statistic part of it because he is a math major and better equipped to talk about that than I am. Um, but we're in a situation where you know, we've crossed, we've seen an inversion on the yield curve. There was a brief period where you could borrow, you could lend money for a shorter period of time and get paid more. Uh, in the last week, we've seen a reversion there. We've seen a significant steepening of the yield curve. Uh, 
particularly this morning as the CPI print was a bit soft. We saw the front end fall and the long end sell off, which we're actually in sort of a steeper position now than we have been all year. But it's something you definitely pay attention to because, you know, you're going to see it on TV, the yield curve inverted. That means, traditionally speaking, in the last seven or eight of these, in seven to 24 months between then, we've had a recession. If you look back at 2005, the yield curve inverted. In late 2007, we saw the beginning of the financial crisis. Uh, if you look back 2019, we inverted in the summer of 2019, we had COVID. You know, whether those things directly caused it uh, is really up for debate, and Sam's going to get into the numbers there, but that's something that someone's going to tell you is a direct indicator of a recession. And I think that that's something we need to be aware of, but probably not too worried about. And so here you can see this is a, a one over the other, right? So you can see this is the spread on, of the 10-year treasury, the two-year treasury. And you can see as we got through COVID all the way down, we got to that negative point right here in the last week. And we've since pumped up. If you look now, we're closer to 35, 40 basis points on that spread. And so... Something to be aware of is that this presents opportunities for clients, and we'll get into that later in the presentation as to how we would play this. But for now, the short end of the curve has been beaten up a lot more than the long end of the curve. Uh, and if you're thinking, man, interest rates are rising, you think, I want to be short. And traditionally speaking, that's true. But the way the yield curve has moved, that's not been the case so far. And we'll get into that later. But Sam's going to get into the nitty gritty of the uh, R squared of yield curve inversions. Thanks, Tom. So. We often like to act like we're better than the uh, financial medium, but when you have a yield curve inversion, it's something we, that we too pay attention to. Uh, however, this yield curve inversion uh, is accompanied with super high inflation that we haven't seen since the 70s and 80s. And so what we did is we took a uh, look at the real yield curve. And so what we did is we used treasury uh, inflation protected securities and stripped out inflation to see what that shape of the 210 yield curve looked like. And so as you can see here, the, the real yield curve inversion uh, might be an even better signal of, of a recession, but the important thing to note is that we're currently at a 1.7 um, spread between the two-year and the 10-year, which basically says the Fed's got a lot of room uh, to, to raise rates. And so we shouldn't be too shy about the, the hawkishness of the Fed right now, talking about some 50-bit rate hikes and several going out uh, throughout the year. Um, and so next thing we looked at was Goldman Sachs did a uh, regression study. And so they looked at all these different uh, variables to see how well they actually predict a recession. And so oftentimes you, when you hear about a yield curve inversion, you hear, oh, it means recession in the next six to 18 months. Well, it doesn't tell you a whole lot. And so Goldman went a step farther and they said, okay, let's look at the 210 inversion that's highlighted there at the top, uh, the S&P 500 six month return, the VIX, and let's see how well it does at predicting a recession in the next six months, in the next 12 months, and then in the 12 months following the next 12 months. And so what we see on that top chart is uh, the R squares of that regression. And for those of you who, who might not know, R squared, you basically want a 0.7 or higher. Um, and none of those R squares are really anywhere close, which basically indicates that none of those variables do a great job at predicting a recession in the next uh, X number of months. Um, at the bottom of the top part of that section, you'll see the combined model. So that was just a multiple regression model they did where they basically fit a model using all those different variables. And they come up with a 0.64 R squared for the 12 month. That was clearly the best um, model, but it's still not that significant uh, statistically speaking in terms of predicting a recession. Uh, and then we, we shift down to the, oh, and one other thing is the S&P 500 return. You said R squared. That means that the S&P 500 return has almost zero predictive ability of a recession. And we like to talk about it at work, which is if the market wasn't down what it is so far year to date, a lot of people wouldn't be talking about uh, an imminent recession. Similar to what Tom was saying in 2019, we had an inversion, but the stock market was up. People, financial media said, oh, we inverted and then moved on to other headlines. Um, and so the bottom part of that chart shows the predicted probability of a recession uh, based on each one of those models. And the most important one to pay attention to would be the combined model at the bottom, which basically shows we got a 38% chance of a recession in the next 24 months. And in particular, we're not talking in the next 12 months, we're talking about the 12 months after that. And so we got a little bit of time before we really worry about this yield curve inversion. Here we got a, another chart. And so what this is, is S&P 500 returns following a 210 nominal yield curve inversion. 
Um, and basically the highlight here is that you got a median of 20 months until a recession actually happens from a yield curve inversion. Uh, and then the other thing to take away from this is the market's up 16% over the next 24 months after all of those uh, inversions. And two thirds of the time we had a positive return on the S&P 500. And so basically what that means is we're not too worried uh, for the time being about the yield curve inversion. It's just something more so to kind of keep an eye on. Yeah, thanks, Sam. It's it's definitely one where we take note of what happens with interest rates and what interest rates are telling us. But when you layer that on with this type of data, you can't make your market-based equity allocation decision solely based on what did the yield curve do on March 31st or whenever the yield curve inverted. So the yield curve, what does it tell us? It tells us there's a potential recession, but it has relatively low explanatory power. Um, the real yield, as Sam pointed out in that, uh, in that analysis, was that the Fed is not too hawkish. And in fact, they actually have room to raise rates even further. In terms of equity markets and volatility, they're going to be volatile as we come down and try to find what normal is. But that does not necessitate that we're going into a recession. All right, we hit the last part of this presentation, and it's going to just be Andrew, then me, then Tom. We're going to talk asset allocation, equity, and fixed income. We we'll start with asset allocation, and really what we want to emphasize here is just the importance of being disciplined and uh, not changing your overall strategy, whatever that may be. Thanks, Ben. Uh, a lot of you in this room have been clients. You've been clients for years, and this is going to seem really, really trite. We talk about this a lot. You know, when people ask what we are doing in periods of market volatility, uh, it sounds relatively simple to say we're doing the same thing we always do. We're staying disciplined to asset allocation targets. We're looking for opportunities, as Tom alluded to earlier, whether it's on fixed income or on the equity side, looking at stocks that we're valuing. But for us, that's what we feel like we're called to do. When we bring on a client, we're keenly aware that much of the value we are bringing to them and to that relationship is specifically tied to discipline. And so if you hear us change our discipline, that's when you should be really worried. You know, if we have you targeting 75% equity and we give you a call out of the blue and say, hey, we think we should go down to 50%, start panicking or start looking for a new money manager. Um, but for us, our goal is to be disciplined and we wanna do that on a daily basis. Uh, we've said this before, but we've never bought more stock as a company than we did in March of 2020. And it wasn't because we thought, hey, this market actually looks really favorable, even though it's down 30% right now, we think we're going to end up 18%. That's not why. It was because we told this client we were going to be 64% equity and we're going to stay 64% equity all the way down. We're going to keep buying, we're going to keep buying, we're going to keep buying. We've never sold more than we did January of 2020. And it wasn't because we said, hey, I heard about this virus. I think it's going to be a big deal. Maybe we should start selling stuff. In fact, one person famously in this room uh, commented, I don't think there's any way we'll be talking about this in March. Um, he meant March of 2023, but you know, I, maybe I didn't clarify that. Um, but we want to stay disciplined. And you can see here, this number, these numbers get a little bit fuzzy, but there is a real value add to the portfolio to have an approach other than just we're going to buy what we're going to buy and we're going to let it run. We're going to buy this mutual fund. We're going to buy this pool of stocks. We're going to buy this model of portfolio and just let it run. Uh, the buy and hold approach yields lower, lower returns. But the other side is if you look at standard deviation, it brings more volatility to the portfolio. We want to generate maximum returns in the smoothest way possible. When we talk to young clients or clients' kids about investing, we kind of use the analogy of, hey, the stock market is essentially a roller coaster. The only difference is it's built on a mountain and it ends at a different place than you started. So you're gonna go up and down, but we're gonna end at a higher point. When we're thinking about that, we're thinking about how can we limit to an extent some of those peaks, but certainly those troughs as the market pulls back. And so by remaining disciplined, we're able to bring some value there. Uh, this is a great chart that shows uh, dating back even just from 2000 to 2013, different approaches. 
Uh, the bottom line there is panic and sell when the S&P is down 20%. Uh, we've had some tough conversations with clients, certainly in 2020, certainly in March of this year, about, no, we don't think we should do this. And we will do everything we can to prevent a client from selling things when they are low, not because we know exactly where we're going to end up at the end of the year or the end of the following year, but because we know a lot about markets historically. And so when we talk about discipline, we want to be constantly rebalancing. We've had opportunities to do that on fixed income this year. We've had opportunities to do that on equity this year. We've been very, very aggressive in our trading. And that may not show up if you just look at a month over month statement. You know, if you, you may look at it and say, well, I owned Apple earlier this year and I still own Apple. Well, yeah, we might have trimmed some. We might have bought more. Uh, every security we're constantly looking at through the lens of our universe of stocks. And I think the single most underrated part of what we do here and a big part of why we do these macro presentations is the in-house research we do. We will read anything that the banks put out that the research shops put out, and we will try to do better. We want to have an edge on the stocks that we are analyzing relative to those companies. We will read all their stuff so that it can inform what we're looking at, but we're looking for an angle on things and discipline on things that we don't think everybody else will bring to the table. And so when we have confidence in something like our universe of stocks, which we'll touch on in just a few moments, that's based on 30 page research reports. A lot of people in here have gotten samples of that. If you ever have a question about something you own, let me know and I can give you something that'll put you to sleep real quick. Um, we had an investment committee meeting today. We went through two stocks that were recently pitched to determine what we're going to do. And we're not goal seeking to find stocks to buy. We are seeking companies that we like. Should this go in our universe? That's question one. Question two is when would we buy it? When would we buy more of it? When would we sell some? When would we be totally out of this company? So we're not doing it from the agenda of, I really want to own stock in this company. We're doing it from, is this a good company? Do they have a favorable macroeconomic backdrop? Do they have a real moat? Are they doing something that other people just can't immediately replicate? Do they have good management teams? And if so, when would we buy it? And so when we do that and we talk about our universe, that's what enables us to be active even though we may say, yeah, the market's down X percent, we're doing the exact same thing we did a month ago, we're much more active and we're much more efficient because we know what we're looking for. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, we, uh, someone uh, pitched Dutch Bros today, and I don't know if anyone actually is aware of that company, but they came public last year. It's a great business, um, but it has 500 coffee shops in the United States, they're trying to go to 4,000. And uh, someone may have spent a, a long time working on the research of that, of that pitch. And uh, I think that it's probably a bit expensive. Um, so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna go there. But um, yeah, we, we definitely spend a lot of time and we're not at all salty when the stocks don't get, uh, get used in the, in, in, in the portfolios. Um, in terms of sentiment, it's not surprising that uh, with consumers sentiment soft and CEO sentiment soft, you also have relatively soft uh, investor sentiment. We also got that number again today at 2.0 is in technically in buy territory according to Bank of America. Um, we have one internally that we kind of look at. Um, this is our universe net buys. Um, so this basically looks at all of our price targets on the buys and all of our price targets on the sells and just nets them out. And that's the orange line. And so when the orange line is high, it means that there are a lot of buys relative to the sells that we're seeing. Right now, we're kind of in no man's land, as you might expect with the market having, having risen a little bit. Um, we have some examples, but the, the big takeaway here is, regardless of whether it's with us or with someone else, stay disciplined to those price targets. This is a market where we found that the, the market is coming to you. You do not need to chase companies, you don't need to chase stories. Um, this is when you want to be focused on the fundamentals, the cash flow and what the company is actually worth, because we're entering a more normalizing environment. The story is going to drive the, um, the stock price less 
perhaps this year than it did coming out of 2020 when there was a reopening trade and there was a, a tech trade and there was a GameStop trade. Um, now I think it's really focused a lot more on the fundamentals. So I think, I think the idea, the big takeaway here is just stay disciplined to whatever price targets you have when you're, when you're managing your portfolio. Um, and uh, I think that'll hold you in good stead. JB Hunt, for instance, we pitched that in February. We didn't know there was going to be a freight uh, correction like it was, um, but we had price targets that were not $215, which is where the, the shares were trading. And we just couldn't justify that. We wanted to justify that. We liked what JB Hunt was doing, um, but we couldn't get the price there uh, to justify that. So stay disciplined to those targets is the, is the big takeaway. And that's similar to what we're seeing in fixed income. So when we last met in, was it January here? You know, we talked about where were the landmines in the fixed income space, and there really was one, and that was duration. Uh, we knew interest rates were going to go up. We didn't know how quickly, but we knew the writing was on the wall and that, you know, there was more risk in, you know, your interest rate risk than there was in your credit risk. And that has definitely played out this year. Uh, you know, basically, if you were a company that was going to go bankrupt, you went bankrupt in 2020. So, you know, the companies that remained were actively working on cleaning up their balance sheets. In terms of the municipal bonds, the, uh, you know, the COVID relief funds had flowed early and often to a lot of states. And so credit quality was really not what we were concerned. We weren't worried about default risk. What we're worried about is what has happened, which is interest rates have risen extremely rapidly. Um, and as a result, now that we're on the backside of that, you know, that's where we're looking for opportunities. We're basically looking through a number of lenses in fixed income. Credit quality is one, you know, do you want to look at junk bonds? Do you want to look at super clean bonds? Uh, structure, duration, what's the price of these bonds and then the sector that we're dealing with. And so right now we, you know, given the rate moves and the rising interest rate environment, there are two real areas where we think there are excellent opportunities. The first is structure, which is going to be, you know, is it a bond that sinks? Is it a bond that floats? Is it a bond that is convertible in some way? You know, the more esoteric you can get in these bonds, the more value there is because you're, you're digging in deeper areas and there are places where you can make money when interest rates are rising. And then duration, you know, we basically have a flat yield curve. You know, you can make as much money buying a two-year bond as a 10-year bond. Well, that if you've got a bond ladder and say last year we had a very steep yield curve where we couldn't really buy bonds in 21, 22, 23, you know, so we we're having to, to push out our duration a little bit in order to, uh, to necessitate the income we needed that front end's come up and now we can fill that right back in. And so there's opportunities on the short end where we can get a lot more yield on shorter bonds. Uh, and that's really where we're seeing opportunities. So in terms of structure, and I know we've talked about this ad nauseum, especially if you've been in a lot of these, that floating rate bonds were something we've been targeting really since the beginning of the pandemic, which are bonds that at the time when interest rates were extraordinarily low, were just exceptionally out of favor. Uh, they, you know, they were basically paying you know, LIBOR plus 50 basis points, which at the time was probably 0.58. Well, LIBOR is the number one uh, financial you know, index that is most closely linked to the federal funds rate. So as we've seen the Fed funds rate you know, start to tick up or we're seeing the expectation of that, you know, we've seen a 25 basis point increase in the federal funds rate. Well, LIBOR is up 1%. And as that keeps going, we're going to continue to see that. So if we buy bonds that are trading at you know, 85 cents on the dollar that have a floating rate coupon, as we see that uh, federal funds rate tick up, you know, things like LIBOR are going to tick up and then some. And so in a situation where, you know, it might've been a bond that at the time no one was looking at, it's not paying you a ton of money. Suddenly that's going to be a four or 5% coupon. CPI link notes is another thing we bought pretty aggressively when we had the opportunity, which is the coupon is based on CPI and CPI is, you know, eight and a half percent as of this morning. So if you're getting a spread to that. Suddenly you've got a 9% paying bond uh, when it was paying, you know, call it 2% two years ago. Uh, and it was very out of favor and very, very cheap. Uh, another piece is step coupon bonds, which are on a schedule, which is, you know, it might pay you 3% for this year, but we know at a certain date, they either have to give you your money back or they've got to increase the coupon. And so we've been very aggressive buying step coupon bonds because we know that in the year 2022, they've either got to make the decision, do we want to make this coupon, keep this coupon at 3% and give you your money back? Or do we want to raise it to 5% and you've got to make, you're going to make more next year and then the third piece is convertible debt. And that's something we look at anytime we see a market pullback, which is these bonds are based on the underlying security. So JB Hunt, as an example, you know, the JB Hunt stock falls, you know, we can go in and buy a bond that's, that's contingent on the price of that stock. So as the stock price rises, 
it can actually go way above the point where you're not even yielding a positive yield. You can sell it at a negative yield. You're just getting all of the upside of the stock uh, in addition to income. And so these are the types of structures we're looking for opportunities now. Is there a company that we really, really like? It's not performed well on a stock basis, but they've got convertible debt, which we can go in and buy at pennies on the dollar because people think it's not going to convert. And that was huge in the pandemic. A lot of companies, you know, famously airlines, you know, when at the very, very bottom of the pandemic market, we're issuing convertible debt because the idea is like, I can pay you, you know, 4% now and if the stock price gets to a certain level, I can convert that to stock. And so I don't have to pay that debt off. I just dilute my shareholders. And if you're that holder, that's awesome for you because you might make 20, 30% on a bond in an environment where bonds are losing 7% this year. And so that's something that we're really looking at hard right now is convertible debt. We looked at it very, very hard in 2020. We made, you know, some really excellent buys on that. And that's something that's coming back into, into focus right now. And then in duration, you know, when we look at, at portfolios, you know, some clients have been on for a short period of time. Some have been on for years. And so as we buy bonds, you can really look at a portfolio and tell when someone came on because you know what the interest rate environment was then. And so as these bonds roll down the yield curve and become shorter, you know, you can see that, hey, you know, at the time, bonds in 2027 were very cheap. You know, but bonds in 2025 were not. We can now, with a flat yield curve, say, hey, let's fit in some bonds in 24 and 25, have that money coming due earlier, but we're getting a lot more money for it. And so we can really fill out a ladder and find these different pieces in each person's portfolio where the best value is that fits your portfolio. Whereas last year, it was like, if you want to buy a two-year corporate, you're looking at getting paid 0.25% and taking on an exceptional amount of duration risk. That's no longer the case. I mean, corporates are down almost 10% this year. Uh, and we thought that was a massive landmine at the beginning of the year. And it may continue to be, but the difference is you're not getting paid 0.25%. You might be getting paid 4% for a two-year bond, at which case we can stomach a little bit of downside, but get that money back in two years and still make 4%. Uh, you know, and especially in an IRA where you're not paying taxes on that, we can make a lot of opportunities really fit to people's portfolios that we didn't have that flexibility before. And that's something that a flat yield curve really helps us with. Uh, so those are really the two areas we're focusing on now. And as always with fixed income, we want income coming in as often as possible. We want money turning back to cash as often as possible. And so uh, this is a really great environment for people who are especially in retirement because, you know, when we might get 1% on a bond before, now we could get three and a half, four percent 4%. Some of that tax-free, some of it not, but it's really an opportunistic time, you know, to really juice the yield and really not have to worry about the credit quality. Because if you look around, especially the muni landscape, when, you know, when I was coming up as a young, young bond trader, people said, never buy Illinois, never buy New Jersey, never buy Connecticut. You know, all three of those states have been upgraded in the last six months for the first time, some of them in 25, 30 years. Uh, and the reason for that is a lot of that COVID money has flowed through. New Jersey, as an example, uh, opened up uh, online sports betting, which has been a massive uh, cash rake for them. And so, you know, if you live in New York and it was not legal, you drive to New Jersey, you place a bet, they get the tax revenue from that. Suddenly, New Jersey's flush with cash. They're not issuing new debt to try and kick the can down the road. They have a cash balance where they can just uh, continue to operate and not have to take on new debt. And so their credit quality has increased while the price of those bonds has decreased. And so we're better, better opportunities with better credit quality and shorter duration, which is, you know, really a triple whammy in terms of what you want in a bond portfolio. So you know, even though it seems grim and bonds are down more than the stock market this year, it's really an opportunity for those people who want to have that conservative piece of the portfolio and really generate some yield for the first time, I mean, really in the last five or six years. All right, Tom, thank you. I think the, the big takeaway as we try to nav navigate through this narrow gate is, you know, we're transitioning from a period of, I'm a Seattle Seahawks fan, I, I grew up in Washington. And a few years ago, you guys might know, we had that philosophy of let Russ cook. Just let Russell Wilson just throw the ball as far as he could to DK Metcalf. And I think what we're doing is we're, trans we're, we're moving now to classic Pete Carroll football and what, how he wants to play, which is play solid defense, get your fundamentals right, run the ball, and stay disciplined. And, and that's really where, where we're coming at it from a portfolio management standpoint. That's where we encourage you to think about it in your own businesses. Stay disciplined. Don't chase the story. Um, whatever your process is, stay disciplined to that. If you're buying a home, if you're uh, trying to run a business, if you're, if you're hiring people, um, this, is, this is not an, necessarily an environment where we're seeing people try to shoot the moon on things. Um, so definitely try to stay disciplined uh, to your process. 
there is a chance of a double dip recession. Whenever we've had a recession, there's always a chance of a double dip recession. That's how it works. It's not our base case, though. Um, we would expect the inflation rate uh, to pull back a little bit, uh, but we're expected to continue to be relatively high, um, especially driven by the price of shelter. Um, and then you're going to, as a result, you're going to continue to see uh, relatively aggressive moves from the Federal Reserve as they try to bring in that, uh, in, as they try to bring down that inflation rate. So with that, I'll hand over to Andrew and he can close this out. Awesome. So uh, last plug for the night uh, on the morning call. Uh, our mission statement, we care about three things, investment performance, service, and I can't thank Andrea and Melissa and John and Luke, who ran out, I think he had a date or something, hopefully with his wife, um, enough for all they do on the client service side. I think hopefully everybody here would attest to the ease of working with us. We want it to be easy to work with us. We don't want you to have to call 800 numbers. Uh, and the third piece is education. We care a lot about the education. Obviously, this is a, a heavy dose of that, but we're on zoom every morning at 8 30 if you go to narwhalcapital.com and you go to the education tab there's two things that show up one is the blog one is the morning market briefing um, we do that every morning with the only exceptions being stock market holidays and days that we do the macro presentation so sorry john i think you logged on in this morning i get notifications so John logged in and was like, these guys are bums. They don't do anything. But, <laughs> but I, I think we do a solid like B minus job on that. Usually Tom and I have to really carry it. Ben's like disheveled and hung over and hadn't showered, but, but we do our best. He really shines in the evenings. Um, but we put a lot of work into that. Uh, Logan, who I don't know if many of y'all met Logan that works for us. He's the ugly guy. Uh, he edits this. So hopefully he'll hear that. We'll know if he edited it or not. Um, <laughs> He's reworked kind of our setup. And so probably not tomorrow because I didn't get with him today. Um, but this week or next week, we'll have a new setup. It's on Zoom, but we'll be on one camera where we can be a little more engaging as opposed to just, hey, Ben, what do you think about this? He goes, hey, Tom, what are your thoughts? We actually have a conversation. It's also available in podcast form uh, wherever you get your podcast. If you search Narwhal Capital, it's there. Um, we care a lot about that, whether it's you logging in, whether it's if you've got family, friends, whatever. Uh, somehow the podcast has more listeners than we have clients. So somebody out there is listening and apparently disagreeing because they haven't called to become a client. Uh, but but check it out. Um, I cannot encourage you enough. That may make these quarterly presentations a little bit repetitive because you've heard a lot of it. Um, but I think it's useful. I think it helps a lot. We started doing this in March of 2020 really with the intention of can we stop having the same conversation every single day 65 times um we're gonna get burnt out let's try to streamline it and it's been i think a really good resource there's a number of people in the room that are on it in the mornings uh john is on there a lot the thompsons are on it a lot if you have questions about what it's like harris is on there a good bit if you have questions about it you maybe you can chat with them or just log in and listen um yeah yeah it's 15 minutes um, so I, I can't encourage you enough to do that. The blog as well is a great resource. Uh, John and Luke have done a great job of kind of drumming up content, making it more varied. Uh, Melissa weighs in a lot there on financial topics and the podcast is going to be slightly reworked. Uh, we're doing some long form stuff on there where we're interviewing people about what they do, how they make money, how they got there. Uh, so check those things out with that. Um, thanks again. Ben really carries the burden of building these presentations. So can't thank him enough. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks, Jason, who's also on the investment committee. Uh, Katie over here uh, is our intern, Kevin Donahoe. Uh, <laughs> blanked on his name. He's just Katie to me. We call him Katie. Um, but uh, thanks to you guys for all your hard work and any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, great question. So for those on Zoom, the question is, how high can rates go? How much is the Fed going to hike? I'm going to pass it to Tom. I mean, at a high level, I mean, even with the 9.6, it's taken us to 2.5% interest, which I think there's probably 
people in this room that like would just if you transported them back you know you went back 15 years and they jumped here right now and they said the fed funds rate is two and a half percent they'd be shocked they'd be wondering what happened uh we've been so low for so long but tom what thoughts do you have so this is a longtime bond trader joke, which is that we have a model for predicting interest rates and she's terrible at it. Uh, so the, my assumption is that given the way the interest rate print was this morning is that there are basically two things that need to happen. One, either interest rates need to rise in order to stem inflation or inflation is going to rectify itself. And there's a lot of factors that are not related to the Fed uh, in terms of the supply chain that could definitely unwind and bring inflation down. So, you know, I think that what my base case is, is that the Fed is going to start raising rates aggressively and inflation is going to also come down naturally. Uh, you know, and I think Matt would disagree, but I think that we're, we're reaching peak inflation. Uh, and I think that we're going to start to see some of these things unwind. So I think that until we get a real good read on uh, the Fed and how many times they're going to raise rates, I think we're pretty much in a free fall in bonds for right now. That being said, I think that the short end of the curve is oversold. So I think that where the real pain is going to be towards the back half of the year is the long end, which would affect mortgage rates. So, you know, if we got to, you know, five and a half or 6% this year, I wouldn't be surprised. But I think a lot of the, the move is going to happen uh, kind of in the next six months. So I don't think it's going to be Every single day we're moving, you know, a quarter quarter point. I think they will probably slowly move there over time. But I think that we're going to get a lot steeper, which is, you know, advantageous for portfolios, maybe not so much for mortgage originators. Um, but I think that the, the goal really for the Fed is to slow things down. You know, there's a, uh, I don't know how many people are, are super into mid 90s punk rock, but there's a band called No Effects and they have a song called We Threw Gasoline on the Fire. And now we have stumps for arms and no eyebrows. Uh, and that's basically what the Fed, is, Fed has done. Uh, they basically said, we're going to try and burn this economy as, as fast and as hot as possible. And now they're saying, oh, man, this thing's out of control. Uh, and so they're going to keep raising rates until they start to see signs that the fire is uh, starting to come back you know, down to a more reasonable level. So you know, the short answer is I think we could get to 6%. I think we could happen uh, relatively slowly. I think it's going to be more you know, as we get the interest rate hikes, we're going to slowly see the long end tick up and those short end tick down. Uh, but again, it's, it's really written in pencil. I think a lot of this stuff, you know, the recession talk, we talk a lot about this internally, which is that, you know, right now the market can kind of go either way. You know, if there's going to be a recession based on interest rates, it's probably written in pencil. And there's a lot of things that could change in order to make it either written in pen or get erased. Uh, and that's really the, the whole thesis of this, of this macro, the narrow door. So we've really got to thread this needle you know, and we're either going to go one way or the other. And I think there's a lot of, of factors that play into it going one way or the other. But I think that ultimately rates are headed higher. Yeah. And another great song, since he's here, I'll embarrass him uh, by David Hall. My father is we threw gas on the grill and now we have melted siding and no wife. Um, so similar situation. Um, and, and I will say, I mean, when when Tom talks about bonds falling off, uh, Tom will hate this. Nobody cares about bonds. Right. Nobody cares about it. Um, <laughs> And in a way, we're not all that concerned about quarterly or even annualized returns on fixed income. What we are concerned about is the buy. On fixed income, we are going to buy and hold. So even when we talk about discipline across asset allocation, there have been a handful of times when we've been selling bonds, but not all that often. For the most part, what we are focused on is can we make the money on the buy? On equity, you haven't made any money on a stock until you've sold it. On bonds, you're getting paid all the way through. And so for us, if we can buy bonds that are secure, that are going to pay you twice a year, that are good buys at that time, that are going to mature at the appropriate time, as he touched on with laddering, if we get that money and we get the return of our principal at the end of it, and ultimately our yield to maturity, or if it's called our yield to call, is what we expected it to be, we're pleased with that. Uh, we still care about performance. Don't mishear me, but ultimately that is the approach on fixed income. So when we think about bonds being down, the biggest thing we think of is if anybody's light in fixed income, we need to be buying because it's an opportunity. Um, we worry about people seeing those kind of paper losses, but we're not really worried based on the credit quality and the credit worthiness of the companies and the municipalities that we've invested in on the fixed income side. Other questions? Is there another question about how 
housing of three classes, particularly in a bit of a bubble where we see prices fall back. I, I think back to the slide that you guys back to the rental prices, the rest of the fact that um, supply is not really caught up in the demand. But what, you know, the, the house price is crazy right now. The market's crazy, lots of pressure on prices. What do you guys see in the yeah, absolutely. So the question is home prices, are we in a bubble? Um, I'll go first, maybe pass it to you next. My view on home prices is actually the same as what it was 18 months ago. 18 months ago, I felt like, hey, prices have really ramped up due to the supply and demand imbalance. We've probably got another two years of elevated increases year over year in home prices. I think it was JP Morgan one time did a hundred year study on you know, primary residences, how much does the home value that you have increase? Is that an investment or is it something that you just need to own so that you're not throwing away rent money? And what they concluded, this was several years ago, what they concluded was relative to inflation over a hundred year period, an individual home on average nationwide increases 1% more than the rate of inflation. We're seeing elevated inflation and we're seeing a significantly higher spread there right now. I think we probably will continue to see a spread higher than that over the next two years. Uh, there is still just such a basic supply demand imbalance right now. Uh, we've got clients that are home builders. They're seeing that. Um, you know, it's interesting if you go back a couple, you know, about a year ago, Lumber had gone through the roof. It's fallen back some and it's been volatile since, but lumber had just gone through the roof this time last year. And the home builders were really quick to complain about the cost of supplies. And yet they had record margins. That indicates to me very strong demand. And when we think about data points on the consumer side, in terms of the number of people looking to make that major purchase, it's still very elevated. And when you combine that with strong, consumer balance sheets, I'll, I'll butcher the data point, but I think it was KB Home said the average amount of money put down on a home, this was last quarter, was 70 grand, uh, 70 grand put down on a home. And these are not, you know, super premium homes. So there's, there's still strength there. There's enough strength there to continue to support that. I think it's an increasingly difficult time for people to get into their first home. And I think that will continue very much so for the next two years, three years, you know, it's until something changes. Um, I think that's going to be a challenge. The people that I am most worried about right now are people that are flipping their equity in their current home and upsizing. Um, I think they could potentially, unless they're moving into a home that they're comfortable owning for forever, uh, they could potentially be in a tough scenario. You know, if you bought a $400,000 house and you can sell yours for 800, you're real tempted to go out and buy a million dollar home. A little bit of move in the housing market is going to be a big problem for you. Whereas if you bought the $400,000 home and you say, hey, it's worth 800,000. If you stay put, you're continuing to build equity and you're going to continue to have a lot of grace there in terms of how much the market would have to come down. But my base case view is, probably another two years of elevated increases. And then I think it will normalize. I don't necessarily know that it's a bubble there. I don't, I, I'm not implying that it's going to pop there. I think we may just then return to inflation plus 1%. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's tougher to get in now than it was two years ago, but my leaning, we've had a number of clients come, their kids are wanting to buy homes, their first homes. Um, my advice has been, yeah, you could wait and wait for things to come back, but I, I could have said the same thing two years ago and you'd be firing me. What and about getting so, out? I, I think it's getting out's an interesting proposition. I think if you're getting, it depends on what you're getting out and going to. If you're getting out and truly downsizing, changing locations, changing something that supports your lifestyle, I think it's probably a decent time to be doing that. Um, I would not be getting in or getting out as an investment measure right now because I think the trend's going to continue for a little while. If you said, hey, I want to go from this size house in this area to this size house in that area as a quick flip, I don't know how successful that's going to be. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add to, to that, Andrew, is I would contrast this a little bit with the freight market, which had a lot of capacity added very quickly. 
they're trying to add supply to the housing market and you're seeing apartment rents go up 17%. You're seeing home prices still go up 17%. So the supply situation is just slower to normalize in homes because it just takes longer to build that and it takes, it's tougher to raise the capital. Um, so I, that, that's the only other thing I would add. I think the supply piece of the equation takes longer to normalize. And you have these waves of demand where people just, people just want to buy a house. Yeah, and the, the other thing I would add, um, we have done direct real estate development investments in the past as a firm. Um, and if you think coming out of the financial crisis, banks didn't want to loan money to anybody to develop a neighborhood. Um, so we had good, reputable builders that we knew had a longstanding working relationship with that would come to us and say, hey, it's a 60 plot neighborhood. I'm going to give you a first on that land, meaning if I don't build a home or sell the lot, you own it, which we don't really want to own land, but you've got some security there. And we'll give you 18% interest. The reason they were doing that is no banks would loan to them. We're starting to see that really ease up a lot. And, and we talk about COVID accelerating trends. We haven't done a deal like that probably since 2018, um, because what we saw was not necessarily that we're close to a correction in 2018 on housing, but we're closer than we were in 2012. And to be in a position in which instead of 18% in the first, I'm now going to have a second position on the land and I'm going to get 10%. The risk reward paradigm has really shifted. Well, the reason they had come down to 10% was banks were starting to lend it a little bit more. I think banks will start lending, continue lending a little bit more for the development side because they see all the data we see. And, and even more so, more granular, more community-based that, hey, there's real demand here. Um, so I think we will get there to where that supply-demand imbalance is rectified. But to Ben's point, I don't think it'll be real quick. Any other questions? All right, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you guys again. If you have questions, come see us. Help yourselves do another drink and uh, we'll be around.